I'm Dana Politan Rubin and my contribution to this workshop is entitled An Internet with BRICS Characteristics, Data Sovereignty and the Balkanisation of the Internet, which I co-wrote with Joss Wright, who is also from the University of Oxford. I unfortunately cannot be with you in person today, but internet connection permitting, I will be answering questions via Skype after this pre-recorded presentation. Next slide, please. Now, by way of introduction, I am obliged to define the term data sovereignty, which is a catch-all term to refer to different state behaviours towards data generated in or passing through national internet infrastructure. Whereas cyber sovereignty can be asserted in multiple dimensions, whether technically, socially, judicially or geopolitically, data sovereignty refers specifically to data flows coming into or going out of a sovereign state. Next slide, please. So why is data sovereignty specifically important? Why should we care about it? Well, it's been over a year now since the revelations that the NSA implemented a global surveillance program which have shaken up the international diplomatic establishment. One thing which has emerged very clearly is that if America, and for that matter the other five ice powers, did not enjoy a privileged position within the underlying architecture of the Internet, they would not have been able to conduct surveillance operations on a mass scale. Hence, America's central role in Internet governance is being questioned more loudly by more people than at any point in the history of the Internet. This has become even more important following the announcement by the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, or NTIA, that the United States Department of Commerce intended to transition domain name functions currently overseen by the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority, or IANA, to the global multi-stakeholder community. The predominant reaction within the Western community has been to warn against Internet fragmentation at a national level as the technical community, including the IETF and IAB, did in the Montevideo Statement issued in October of last year. Similarly, Anupam Chanda and Uyan Le of UC Davis warned against data localization in their paper Breaking the Web, published in April this year. However, there is no question that American credibility as good stewards of the Internet has been badly damaged. Even the European Union, one of America's closest allies, is considering adopting a local cloud to protect its data from surveillance. Next slide, please. This paper looks specifically at the data sovereignty requirements and the internet governance debates happening within the BRICS consortium. The BRICS countries are Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa, and considering that the consortium was only formed in 2009, it has come to have a significant amount of international clout. This isn't very surprising considering that collectively the BRICS countries have about 40% of the world's population, 20% of global GDP, 18% of the world's economy, and $4 trillion in foreign reserves. Most recently, last month, the consortium formally established the New Development, the New Development Bank which is meant to counterweight the previously uncontested Western financial institutions of the IMF and World Bank. Next slide, please. Now, many of the BRICS countries have already participated in various Internet governance forums, even predating the formation of the consortium. All five participated in the World Summit on the Information Society in 2003 and 2005, and all came to the Internet Governance Forum meeting in Bali last year. The Global Multi-Stakeholder Meeting on the Future of Internet Governance, or Net Mundial, held in Sao Paulo this past April, saw contributions from stakeholders in all five countries, and most recently all but South Africa participated in the 50th ICANN meeting in June. Next slide, please. Some collaborations have already occurred within the bloc as well. All but India signed the controversial final acts of the World Conference on International Telecommunications in 2012, which appeared to assert sovereignty rights for member states and a central governance role for the ITU. In 2011, China, Russia, Tajikistan and Uzbekistan proposed a voluntary international code of conduct for information security to the UN General Assembly, which has thus far failed to reach consensus. 
Brazil and Germany, on the other hand, successfully submitted a resolution in November 2013 asserting the right to privacy in the digital age, which frames data sovereignty as a human rights issue. Next slide, please. Moving on, I have done a requirements analysis of the data sovereignty needs of each of the BRICS countries, which I'll now talk about in acronym order, starting with Brazil. The internet governance debate has actually been occurring in Brazil for many years now, encapsulated by the recently passed Marco Civil da Internet, which, as far as I know, is the first digital rights charter to be signed into law. Although its first draft emerged in 2009, it was only after the NSA revelations last year that the political will became strong enough to pass it. One interesting change was required to pass the Marco Civil. In November 2013, following revelations that the NSA had spied on President Dilma Rousseff's personal communications, President Rousseff personally advocated for an amendment which would have required foreign cloud service providers operating within Brazil to store Brazilian data on servers hosted in Brazil. However, the final language of the Marco Civil merely makes foreign cloud service providers operating within Brazil beholden to Brazilian law, which risks being unenforceable if the home country of the provider has legislation contradicting Brazil's. Next slide, please. Brazil also hosted Net Mundial, which was the first internet governance meeting to explicitly invite the contributions of stakeholders from multiple segments of society. Net Mundial received 187 contributions, 19 of which involved Brazilian stakeholders. Additionally, stakeholders from all other BRICS countries also contributed. China had two contributions, one from the government and the other from Ch the China Institutes of Contemporary International Relations. India had five contributions from the government, private sector and non-profits. Russia had three contributions, one from the government and two from the Russian Center for Policy Studies. And the Association for Progressive Communications, which has its executive director's office in South Africa, submitted two contributions, although notably the South African government did not submit any contributions. Given that Brazil supports multi-stakeholderism but is wary of Western hegemony over the internet, it is establishing itself as a powerful arbiter between the Western multi-stakeholder consensus and countries like Russia and China who prefer a more central role for the state. Next slide, please. <clears throat> On to Russia, where an increase in internet regulatory legislation has been seen following the 2012 re-election of President Vladimir Putin. Russia's own do domestic surveillance system, SORM, has been conducting operations since the mid-1980s. According to a joint investigation by Agentura.ru, Citizen Lab and Privacy International, Russian telecoms providers are mandated to install SORM equipment but have no right of access to the surveillance boxes. Next slide, please. Russia has recently passed a few regulatory bills, including the Internet Restriction Bill and a bill known colloquially as the Blogger Bill. The Internet Restriction Bill was signed into law in July 2012 and it created the single register of websites censored in Russia. Although in theory only censored material, the only censored material pertains to child pornography, drug use and suicide, in practice websites are blocked by IP address meaning that if one website associated with an IP address is blocked, every website hosted on that server will be blocked as well. This has led to the censorship of innocuous websites such as Lurkmore, a wiki-style humour site which featured one page explaining drug slang. Next slide, please. The so-called Blogger Bill was passed this year, and it requires bloggers with more than 3,000 daily readers to register with Roskomnadzor, the Russian Media Oversight Agency. This effectively prevents popular bloggers from remaining anonymous, deterring domestic dissent. Next slide, please. Russia's primary concern seems to be the ability to control the flow of information within its borders, as opposed to the flow of data. This is reflected in the law recently passed in the lower cha chamber of the Russian parliament requiring all Russian data to be stored on Russian servers by September 2016, a bill strikingly similar to the rejected amendment of the Marco Civil. Additionally, an examination of Russia's aforementioned joint proposal to the UN reveals some interesting language. 
The proposal asserts the right to prevent the dissemination of information encouraging secessionism and specifically identifies the information space as a national domain alongside the critical information infrastructure. Next slide, please. However, at least on the data sovereignty front, not all news coming out of Russia is bad news. Russia has been systematically updating its legislation on personal data processing to bring into line with European data protection laws. This suggests that Russia recognizes an economic benefit to adopting a privacy stance similar to the EU, at least on paper. It will be interesting to see whether this approach is continued in the wake of the economic sanctions imposed by the United States and the EU. Next slide, please. India's data sovereignty requirements are very much centered around its business process outsourcing industry, which even in the mid noughties commanded 43% of the global market for IT sector outsourcing and 1% of Indian GDP. In April 2011, India updated its Information Technology Act of 2000, which with several privacy related amendments pertaining to private sector data processing, including mandating that businesses must have a privacy policy, must obtain consent for data collection, and can only share data with companies which have the same standard of data protection. Next slide, please. India's focus on private sector data protection seems more designed to safeguard its international market than to guarantee digital rights for its own citizens. For example, India and the UK made a cyber pact in 2012 to protect British data stored in Indian data centres. Given the fact that India's internal debate on data sovereignty is driven by the private sector and is primarily discussed in relation to cloud services, it seems most likely that India would favour a Western, multi-stakeholder approach to internet governance, as opposed to a Sino-Russian approach. Next slide, please. We now move on to China, where cyberspace is explicitly seen as a national domain. The Golden Shield project, known colloquially as the Great Firewall, has, through the mechanism of censorship, created a nearly separate Chinese internet ecosystem, in which nat national web service companies like Search Engine Baidu and microblogging site Sina Weibo have been able to flourish due to the restriction of foreign service providers. China supports international democracy within internet governance, democracy here being understood to mean equality among sovereign states, as opposed to representing the interests of individual citizens. As part of this drive for equality among states, China not only emphasizes a state's right to sovereignty over its data, but also advocates for non-interference in other states' sovereign affairs, including within the cyber domain. Next slide, please. Although China stresses non-interference, in reality it conducts extensive cyber espionage operations, most notably to steal intellectual property from Western companies. China's new stealth jet was embarrassing for America, built using F-35 fighter jet blueprints stolen from Lockheed Martin. However, in perhaps a tit-for-tat which was equally embarrassing for China, the NSA managed to create backdoors into Huawei operators' networks. National level discourse on data sovereignty has therefore focused on how to safeguard sensitive data from foreign intelligence services. Next slide, please. <clears throat> However, again, not all news coming out of China is bad. While China clearly favours a central role for the state within internet governance, it has been making several moves lately which suggest that it is not entirely opposed to the multi-stakeholder model. These include establishing a national-level multi-stakeholder internet development conference, attempting to maintain dialogue with the United States via the Track 2 Cyber-US Sino-US Cybersecurity Dialogue, establishing a Sino-European Cyber Dialogue, and referring to multi-participation at the 50th ICANN meeting this past June, where the Chinese representative discussed potential roles which different stakeholders could play in global internet governance. Next slide, please. Given that it only approved a national cybersecurity policy framework in 2012, South Africa seems to be behind other BRICS countries in terms of its data sovereignty debate. 
The South African government has been notably absent from recent internet governance forums, including ICANN 50 and Net Mundial. Nigeria, on the other hand, has been very active within the global internet governance debate and appears to be heading an African bloc, pushing for a multi-stakeholder approach to governance, which stresses human rights, development and access. Next slide, please. If we plot different BRICS country approaches to internet governance on Mueller's graph, we can see that China and Russia fall within the cyber reactionaries quadrant, which favours a hierarchical and national level approach to governance. Brazil is in a fulcrum position within the global governmentality quadrant, which favours a transnational hierarchical governance regime. And India and South Africa are in the denationalised liberalism quadrant, where governance decisions are transnational and left to free association. Next slide, please. Should the BRICS consortium reach a consensus on data sovereignty, it could powerfully influence the global governance debate. Two general forms of consensus are possible, favouring either weak or strong data sovereignty. Weak data sovereignty, which is the more likely consensus, is defined as private sector-led data protection initiatives with an emphasis on the digital rights aspect of data sovereignty. This consensus would mandate that Russia and China give way on cultural protection issues in order to maintain economic com competitiveness, although neither country is expected to fully embrace a digital rights approach. One risk of a weak data sovereignty consensus is that global governance lists too heavily towards denationalized liberalism and fails to develop internationally respected human rights norms. Next slide, please. By contrast, strong data sovereignty favors a state-led approach with an emphasis on safeguarding national security. This consensus would present a clear challenge to the currently accepted Western consensus, which would lead to global internet governance issues. A strong data sovereignty consensus could be used to increase censorship activities within the BRICS bloc. As the United States has already specified within its international strategy for cyberspace that it reserves the right to use military force to defend against a cyber attack, should states like China and Russia also adopt this policy, it could lead to the escalation of cyber attacks into kinetic attacks. Next slide, please. There would also be severe economic implications to a strong data sovereignty consensus. Asserting sovereignty over data stored in a national jurisdiction would erect new barriers to operating an international cloud computing service. This would affect any business processing personal data, not just the IT sector, and would effectively render business process outsourcing untenable. The financial sector would also be affected as banks would face challenges to conducting international transactions. Next slide, please. However, even with a strong data sovereignty consensus, the balkanization of the internet, or the creation of isolated national intranets under the complete jurisdiction of the state, may not be technically feasible. Source routing is not supported in the currently implemented core routing protocols, and while a national level intranet is possible, it would suffer from problems of scale as well as economic and social problems. Sufficiently robust cyber powers such as the Five Eyes have also demonstrated through programs like Tempora that interception devices can be installed outside of their official jurisdiction. Next slide, please. The other question is whether balkanization is even desirable within the BRICS bloc. China, despite being the paragon of national censorship, has still been reaching out to other countries to collaborate on internet governance issues. The banishment of all multinational cloud service providers from national markets would severely hamper trade, which would have a negative effect on the global economy. Remember also that despite having enormous political capital after the NSA revelations, the Marco Civil still had to be purged of its balkanizing language to ensure that it would pass. I would therefore conclude that the creation of a BRICS-only intranet does not seem likely in the near future. Next slide, please. A number of avenues for future work on this topic exist, including an ongoing analysis of the BRICS countries and their individual and collective approaches to internet governance issues. 
This analysis could also be expanded to include the G20 economies and other developing countries. This technical feasibility of the gathered requirements could be assessed by comparing them to the current internet protocols and the likelihood of modifying internet protocols to support data sovereignty requirements could also be assessed. Next slide, please. We've now reached the end of my presentation. Technology permitting, I am standing by on Skype, ready to answer your questions. Thank you. Just a second while I dial her up. Hello? Uh, hi Dana, this is Jeg, can you uh, hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, and let me see if I can get you on the screen. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so everybody's here and we can see you and we can hear you, so... Uh, Brilliant. I've been told to give a shout out to Mike Fuji, who's been relaying uh, updates in real time to my colleague Greg. So, okay. hi Mike. Cheers. Okay, cool. So, yeah, if you have a question, can you come to the front and talk into the microphone on the uh, laptop? Dana, I hope you hear Hello. me. Hello. Uh, my name is Marat, and I'm actually <clears throat> from Russia. Um, and um, uh, yeah, and I'm working with a fund of uh, uh, anti-corruption fund led by Alexei Navalny, if you've heard of it. So that's pre pretty much the person whom uh, these laws are designed against, you know. Mm. Uh, but there are like oh, one little comment about your presentation. First thing is that uh, actually the law doesn't, uh, like the blocking law, doesn't work only by IP. You can actually block by URL as well. Really? And, oh, okay. Uh, DNA, DNS name as well. So it depends on the case. So for Twitter and Facebook, since they're HTTPS only and uh, they don't feature domain names, so it's like slash, you know, Navalny, then you can't effectively block the URL because ISPs don't have a control over your URLs. This is why we come to second law, which mandates storage of all data on Russian servers and uh, actually uh, forces uh, uh, bloggers to register uh, as uh, mass media if they are over 3,000, uh, if they have more than 3,000 followers. By the way, yes. I, I have more than 3,000 followers. <laughs> um, so the thing is, uh, the question is, you were talking about balkanization a lot, uh, but the whole thing is storage of uh, privacy data in, uh, the country of jurisdiction actually came from Europe. So yes, it did. I think, don't you think you should be comparing not like Russia and China to Brazil, but like to UK and Germany, which actually originated the whole thing, you know, in mainly for not protection reasons from NSA. The reason why Germany in initiated that is to have access to, to enable law enforcement uh, to basically investigate uh, criminal cases on the internet by just accessing servers physically. Like this is why they, they can just basically enter the data center, pull the server out and see who did what while cross jurisdiction requests, like when you had to make a request to the United States, for example, would take them a lot of time. So they would lose it. Not, not because they wanted to protect poor uh, German people data, in a say, you know, it's scary. Uh, so oh. what do you think about like, well, I, I do agree with you. Um, you know, the, the fact is that um, these sorts of uh, Schengen clouds of, uh, of data are, have dual uses. Um, while it looks very nice on paper to advocate keeping um, European data within the European jurisdiction, 
um, you, you are right that it does make law enforcement quite a bit easier within Europe if you need to get to somebody's email, if you need to, if you need to be able to look at somebody's digital footprint. Um, my, my main purpose really in comparing Russia to Brazil is that I found it very interesting that uh, the reactions for both different uh, amendments were completely different because when, when this amendment was pro proposed in Brazil, um, the, the public reaction was... I mean, it, it, was, uh, it, it almost was, was very happy to see Brazil trying to implement this, um, whereas when Russia tried to implement something which was pretty much identical, um, and identical to something that Europe has been discussing for, for several years now as well, um, when Russia tries to implement it, um, everybody kind of threw their arms up in the air and uh, started running around. Um, so I find, I find it very interesting, and I'm not saying that it's a, I'm not saying that it's a good law to implement, um, because it can, because as you say, it does it does open up um, citizen data for unprecedented sort of domestic surveillance. If you can ensure that all Russian data is stored on Russian servers within Russia, um, you know. But but at the same time, this isn't anything new. It's it's uh, something that is that has been happening in in Europe and in the UK as well. So I think if we if we are going to be looking at these different things, you're right that we need to we need to look at multiple different countries and look at what everybody's doing as opposed to just focusing on what one or two people are doing. Yeah. So this is what I'm saying. The clustering is not by like bricks or not bricks. It's clustering by the co governments that feel safe with their like uh, people. You. Uh, elected and uh, pe people who are, feel not safe with the people. I, uh, I mean, like say China and Russia, they mainly filter uh, not the actual criminal activity but anti-government activity. While yes, uh, while Brazil actually is not uh, interested in that. They're interested in more like in Europe as well. Like they more interested in filtering uh, like say criminal activity. Actually, data privacy protection law in Russia is very simple. Like it's much easier mm. to implement than in Europe. But like well, it's interesting that you say that about Brazil because I think it, it depends on the kind of, uh, you know, domestic dissent that you encounter. I mean, for example, while Dilma Rousseff has been very active as far as, you know, trying to get the Marco Civil passed, um, you know, if you, if you go to the north of the country where um, she's supporting, you know, the pe people logging in the, in the Amazon and building the, this, these dams, um, you, you know, that they those, that kind of dissent is being monitored and is, is trying to be, be suppressed. So I think it, 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 even, even the suppression of dissent is not, is not uniform within either the BRICS bloc or within the European countries within the United States. Um, and this, I feel like if you have the potential, um, if the technology is there, um, it's going to be there for everybody, whether you like them or not. And if you, if you think that you're safer in one jurisdiction or another jurisdiction, um, you know, you can see that the technology has the potential to be used for some very dangerous things. So I think you have to, you have to really be careful allowing, allowing some people to have this technology that you think that you can trust, whereas not allowing other people to have the technology that you know you can't. Thanks. Hi, Dana. Hello. Hey, this is Masashi. How are you? Um, I just I'm have a more of a general question since you're the most policy focused paper uh, of the workshop. If, and you discussed this a little bit in your talk and the future work and some other aspects, but you could just speak a little bit more about what some of the opportunities are for policy research, like what you're doing, to be informed by technical measurements and some of the things that <clears throat> more of the people in the audience are working on in terms of network measurement, uh, circumvention, and, and uh, other aspects like that, and what some of the challenges are and uh, how we may be able to address those as a community. Yes. Um, well, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of interesting overlap between more policy-based research and actual technical research because obviously, um, you know, policy research is informed by what's possible, and technical research is pushing the boundaries of what's possible all the time. Um, so, for example, one of the things that I'm quite interested in looking at are the protocols themselves to see exactly how they're designed and what what different what little changes might be able to accomplish in terms of implementing some design requirements. Um, so, and that 
and these design requirements are informed by different kind of cultural um, insights as to how people think the internet should work. Um, so this is, I think it's very important that both communities kind of bounce off each other. And um, certainly one, one thing that, um, one challenge that I find as, as more of a policy researcher is simply the fact that, um, you know, I, I think that uh, policy people know that they're not necessarily um, technically oriented, um, whereas uh, technical people can't necessarily see um, their own kind of policy bias in what they're doing. Um, so one of the things that I'm very interested in is, is being able to inform about the, the bigger picture and um, allowing people to sort of see where the biases are in terms of what they're working on and to question those biases so that they can come up with something that's, that's truly groundbreaking in terms of being global, being accessible, um, you know, being able to be used by a wide variety of different people. I hope that helps. <laughs> I hope that answers the question. Oh, thank you. Any, any other questions for Dana? Okay, great, well let's thank her remotely.